get started. All right, everyone. So uh, thank you very much for coming to this distinguished uh, lecture series of our LS unit. Um, my name is Andreas Bulling. I'm one of the directors of the unit, and I'm very happy um, to see all of you here. But of course, most importantly, uh, I'm very, very excited to see uh, Jonathan here and, and welcome him to our lecture series. Um, we're very glad to have you. Um, so Jonathan is an associate professor um, at Tel Aviv University, um, but currently actually at uh, Google DeepMind in the US. Um, and you know, time actually works out works out quite well. Um, he got his PhD also from Tel Aviv, um, and then was a postdoc subsequently at Stanford and also at, uh, at Google Research. Um, and yeah, um, as you may have seen or assumed from the title, um, or you may know him already. Um, in his work, he is going to talk about um, NLP uh, related uh, topics today. And yeah, with further um, any further ado, uh, Jonathan, I would suggest the stage is yours. Um, we're very excited to have you, and um, yeah, very yeah. much looking forward to your talk. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, thanks for the invite. Uh, feel free to ask uh, questions during the, the presentation. Um, uh, if it becomes more interactive, that's always nice. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I've, I've sent some abstract. I don't think it's exactly what I prepared, <laughs> but it's like around the same ballpark. So the title is Now Retrieval in the Age of Large Language Models. Uh, also, another side note, uh, as Andreas said, I'm currently, since February, I've been on a sabbatical at Google DeepMind, and I've kind of like radically shifted my focus towards uh, things related to uh, uncertainty of reward models, which are now used uh, for language model alignment for those who are familiar, uh, but it's a little bit still work in progress. I'm not even sure. I, I think like I need to like uh, ask permission to talk about things Google before speaking. Um, but it's still not like ready. If you, anyone has some questions at the end, I'm happy to answer. But for now, I'm going to focus on things I've done uh, in the context of my role in Tel Aviv University. Okay, so. As we all know, um, very impressive uh, language models now exist. More than language model, there is very impressive language understanding systems that exist now in the world. Uh, I think yesterday there was another demonstration by OpenAI of some of the new things that they are allowing and releasing for the for the for the community and the world in general. Um, and there have been a lot of demonstrations of that. I'm sure all of you have seen amazing examples. These are not necessarily particularly amazing, but I made them like maybe six months ago. Well, first of all, they have a lot of knowledge about both language. They understand language very well, and they know a lot about the world. So here's a question. Can you list all Israeli songs that won the Eurovision contest? And I checked this, and this is 100% uh, correct. Uh, Israel won four times. These are the songs, these are the performers, and these are the years. Um, this is not exactly, I mean, it's not tail, it's not head information in the web, but not tail information somewhere in the middle. Um, these models can, um, you know, exhibit the ability to read text and understand it quite well, applying common sense. Again, this is just like a made up example I made about some people and uh, their professions and which one of them are white collar professions, which ones are not. <clears throat> and it, it correctly identifies those and explains what are those uh, in a very coherent manner. Um, language models are used broadly for code assistance. Um, so again, here are two examples. On the left, you describe in natural language, uh, like the schema of some uh, database um, and then you ask, like, can you please write a SQL query that uh, uh, retrieves the number of purchases in each store, and it will, you know, kind of like imagine what the 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 the, the table looks like exactly, and output the correct SQL query. And this is this is actually correct. Uh, nowadays that I'm in Google DeepMind, um, I I actually like you know do some data science and write code, but I don't remember how to do it. That's the problem. So I use uh, Bard all the time uh, for like using, I didn't use pandas when I was a PhD student or a postdoc, um, but now I use it all the time. So, you know, I just like, I don't know anything. So uh, my coding process, basically I ask Google Bard how to do stuff and then it tells me, and then I copy the code and I run it and most often, more often than not, it, it basically works. So here's an example. There's a data frame with grades of students in many courses. How do I plot a histogram of the number of students whose average score is in some range? And it will like imagine some some data frame and give me like very precise. And you can run this, and this this will work. So this is impressive. 
Um, you can extract knowledge from the parameters of the model. So we had a paper at like findings of the ACL where we can like extract knowledge graphs from the, from the knowledge that is embedded in the parameters of the language model. Uh, so here's, here's an example, and I can just tell the model, you can imagine describing a knowledge graph about entities. For example, here's a knowledge graph around Quentin Tarantino. Well, he was born in some year, his spouse is uh, an Israeli uh, person, and he has some height. Uh, and now I, I tell the model, can you please describe the knowledge graph around uh, Angela Merkel? And it will do a pretty good job. Uh, it's not, maybe you know better than me, it's not 100% accurate. So I, I think this is false. Like one of the facts is actually uh, false. Uh, perhaps you can tell me better. Uh, so there's this issue of hallucinations. Okay. So, I mean, it's very, very, very impressive. Uh, but still there are limitations. A lot of people talk about limitations, which are related to like handling ambiguity and so on. I want to talk today about limitations that are related to one very particular thing, which is the fact that uh, these transformers kind of inherently have like a fixed context length. Unlike various recursive structures, they, they just like define like how much text they, they, they can consume. And that's the amount of text that they consume. So typically nowadays, again, this has been ever expanding with various hardware optimizations. Uh, people can run like vanilla transformers. I'm assuming people have heard of transformers, which are um, which are used like what's called dense attention over sequences of 1000 tokens. Tokens are like these units that are kind of like words, but not exactly. Um, maybe 10,000 tokens. People can even scale this to tens of thousands of tokens. Uh, you can just like apply transformers and pre-train them. Uh, and it's, it's doable. Uh, recently, there's been more and more interest in applying transformers to sequences that are even longer than that, like 100,000 tokens or maybe even a million tokens. And I think I'm not going to talk a lot about this today. And there's a lot of uh, interesting uh, applications. So, you know, within the realm of natural language processing, you know, there's books. Books can be hundreds of thousands of tokens. Uh, but there's now transformers are used widely also for audio and video, which easily can be very, very long sequences. And I also think there's a lot of interesting use cases in the new role of large language models as kind of like uh, data science uh, assistants. Uh, first of all, code can be very long, so you can use them also for code. But, but you know, I don't know, like now people use uh, pre-trained language models. They say, OK, here's like a ton of data. Can you find patterns in this data? Or here are like my training examples. Are there like biases that you see? Various very interesting use cases where you want to feed uh, like pre-trained language model pretty long sequences of text and have them do kind of like global aggregation procedures. And this is kind of like a new avenue that I think is pretty exciting. Um, and for that, you need perhaps something else. And there's been a substantial amount of work on this, like. Uh, by making transformers more sparse. So one of the bottlenecks of transformers is that their complexity is quadratic in the length of the sequence because every um, input token uh, performs some operation like attends to every other input token. So there's like a quadratic dependency. And even more than that, there's like these huge feed forward networks that are applied per position, which consume a lot of uh, flops. So, um, so there's been, there's been a lot of progress on this, both in sparse transformers, hierarchical transformers, where you kind of like uh, apply, you know, there's like a shallow, shallow layer that kind of like works locally, and then like another layer that is more global. There's been work on state space models, which um, do not have this quadratic uh, problem. Uh, they're, they're like uh, n log n, if n is the length of the sequence. My general feeling is that we're at a point where this is becoming model-wise uh closer to being solved and handled well i had some work on this uh but i'm not going to talk about that at all today um but yeah there's been steady progress in terms of modeling and now i think more of the work is around like getting data and maybe doing evaluation properly which is also something that that people are interested in but i think this is like pretty interesting but let's not talk about that today and the last setup is like the retrieval setup, where you assume that um, you have like a big data store or a big corpus. It can be maybe billions of tokens, and you want to somehow use that 
together with like your pre-trained language model. Uh, and that is what I would like to kind of like focus on today. Uh, so just like in a nutshell, what, what do I mean by like uh, models that are augmented with retrieval? So I'll just explain it with two examples. Let's say that, um, you know, you have a question like when was the Stuttgart LS unit established? Uh, well, one option, if you don't want to use uh, uh, retrieval, is just to feed this question. Uh, do you see my cursor, by the way? It's just to feed this question yes, to the that. language model. And the language model might know this because it crawled the web and, like, you know, um, tried to reduce some loss of predicting the next tone, the token one trillion times. So it maybe maybe learned that it's in 2021, which I think is correct. Uh, correct me if this is wrong. Um, but another possibility is to, you know, have some huge index over the web and first to retrieve from the index some relevant pieces of text. And, this, and then the input to the language model is not just the question, but also a bunch of passages that may or may not have some relation with this information. And, and if the information, if the information that it was founded in, uh, it was established in 2021 is there, then instead of like memorizing it in the parameters, you can just read it by doing like language understanding. So this is a pretty clear example of that. Another example is in, in the context of what's often termed in-context learning. Uh, and in-context learning is basically a paradigm that was popularized when GPT-3 arrived, uh, where given some, some tasks, so here is the task of translating some command, give me directions to the Eagles game, to um, you know, some API call so that you can apply it over some some knowledge that you have and, and, and get like the answer, which are the directions. Um, so this paradigm, which is called in-context learning, the idea is that you retrieve other cases where you had to translate from natural language to some API call, uh, and you show the model these examples as it's generating the, the, the answer, the output. And by being able to observe other examples as it is solving this particular problem, you can you can improve your performance, and you can even do this without any parameter updates, without any training at all. So again, in this case, you can imagine that you have some training data, and you have like a huge language model. You don't want to like change the parameters of the language model at all. But what you can do is is put these examples in some data store, and then retrieve from the data store some examples. And then when you you're asking the model to to translate this query into the API call, it has some examples to learn from, basically. And there's been a lot of work on how this is done, whether like tr these transformers can emulate uh, some form of gradient descent, descent within their activations. I never worked on this topic, but it's pretty fascinating. OK, so this these are just like two instances of retrieval augmented language models. But you can imagine just in general, like whenever you have some text as input and you need to produce some text as output, you can retrieve any auxiliary data that is relevant while you're doing this generation. <clears throat> so one definition that I saw in like a recent ACL tutorial is that a, a retrieval augmented language models are a language model that uses an external data store at test time. And, and they have like pretty clear kind of like compelling use cases and advantages. Um, so first, in terms of factuality, one of the main problems with using language model is that people have noticed they that whenever they don't know something, they will just make up stuff that sounds fluent and coherent, but is but is wrong, right? Like, I don't know. I tried at some point, I was writing a recommendation letter and I was trying to kind of like compare like the person to other people. I was thinking like, who, you know, who are recent faculty that were hired like in the world in NLP? So I asked like uh, ChatGPT and it just like made up, like it just gave like very famous names. I'm like, like my, my, my postdoc advisor, Percy Liang, and it said like, you read, I don't know, it's just like very bad, very fluent, but very bad. So factuality is a huge issue, right? Like, I don't know, I'm working now at uh, Google and that's like a major, major concern now that these things are deployed. <clears throat> um, by having retrieval, you can get, can get like for free explainability and provenance and attribution, you can say, okay, in this huge corpus, like if, if I retrieved a particular passage, then there's better chances that the model generated the answer based on this passage. It's not guaranteed. It kind of like depends on like if you fine tune it to do that, but it provides like another layer of, of provenance. 
Um, it allows you to be fresh. You can kind of like change the fact that you can kind of like change the data store all the time is very useful. You can make sure that you're always retrieving things that are current, unlike and not have like this cutoff. If you ever use ChatGPT or GPT-4 for asking about things that are beyond 2022, then it will say, well, my cutoff is April 2021 or something. Uh, I think as of yesterday, it's no longer the case. They updated it to be 2023. Um, there's privacy issues. You can just like reduce from the data store things that you don't want. You have better control. And you're kind of like basically trading off computation from memory. Instead of like computing, uh, you know, where is Stuttgart, you just remember that. So there's a lot of like useful use cases. But in reality, <clears throat> Most of us are not using retrieval augmented language models. Like most of the models kind of like have retrieval and as this like not first citizen part of the model. And that's, I don't know, that's the way it is. So there's this gap between what you think could be and what there is. So here's like some characterization of the space of how you can use retrieval augmented language models. Um, so one possibility is to just like, so a retrieval augmented language model has two parts. It has the language model. A language model, I assume people know, is this uh, neural network that predicts, uh, given some piece of text, predicts a distribution for the next token. It's like a, uh, you know, left to right language model, not like uh, top down or anything. Um, so it has the language model we can generate from which you can sample or decode text. And then there's, there's a retriever that provides information for the language model. So one thing to do is just like completely train them separately. You have a retriever, maybe that retriever is, you know, Google search engine, uh, and you have a language model, maybe that language model is a GPT-4 or something, and they don't know about one another, but like you retrieve information using Google search engine, shove the text that is retrieved from that to the language model, and, and maybe good things happen. Another possibility is to have some connection between them where you adapt the language model to, to the retriever. You're saying, okay, my retriever is Google search engine and I have this language model. I'm gonna do some training procedure to change the parameter of the language model such that it is better aware of the retriever. Okay, so like the retriever provides some, some, some text like, I don't know, I'm, I'm asking, I don't know, who is Jonathan Berendt? And I get some text from like my website. And now the model will learn how to use information from the web with this query in order to produce like a coherent answer. So that's one possibility. And it makes sense in the case, again, you have like a fixed search engine, but you would like to adapt your language model. You have like the ability to do that. There's also like the opposite case where you can imagine that you don't want to have a language model. It's this huge beast. You're not interested in like, <clears throat> you know, maintaining it, updating it, having multiple copies of it. It's like this huge thing, but retrieval is like a simpler task for some reason. Then you can um, basically build a retriever that learns to retrieve things that are useful for this particular language model. So that's like another approach that you can take. And lastly, you can train them jointly. You can imagine that somehow you're training both the retriever component and the language model, and both of them are kind of learned to be aware. The language model learns how to uh, process data that is retrieved by the retriever, and the retriever learns to retrieve things that are used for, for the language model. Uh, so I want to talk about this space a little bit in this talk. Um, I'll talk a little bit about independent and adapting LM in a pretty recent manuscript that was submitted to iClear by my student Ori. Uh, I will talk a little bit about adapting the retriever based on work from my student Ohad from last year, and then also uh, follow up by Ohad on how to train jointly the retriever and the language model. So that's the plan. I don't know, it was a pretty long introduction, but that's okay for my side at least. Um, so if you have questions, that's a good time. If not, we can continue. Cool. Okay, so this is like a recent work by uh, Ori, Tomer, and the two Oris, Ori Y and Ori R, uh, and, and Tomer. Wolfson, my students, um, on making retrieval augmented language models robust to irrelevant context. So in this setup, we examine the pretty popular paradigm of the independent training uh, that I described above, that was described earlier by Ori in a paper I had nothing to do with. Uh, so here's what it looks like, more or less. Um, you have a trained retriever, you do not touch it. It's trained however you want. It can be Google search engine, it can be Bing, it can be trained with contrastive learning, it can be trained in any way you want. And you have a language model, you don't train it. And the only thing you do is the following. This is a language modeling task. So the input is a sequence of text. World Cup 2022 was last 
with 32 teams before the increase two. And now the retriever retrieves some text. Uh, this is the text uh, and it's just prepended. Uh, and the pre-printed text uh, and the query, the input are fed to the language model. And by the fact that the number 48 appears here it is just copied here. Uh, so this is very simple. Uh, and they have shown that this leads to improvements in perplexity. So on uh, using various um, language models and retrievers and data sets, uh, they show like if you compare the blue to the red, where in perplexity lower is better, you see that just this simple procedure leads to uh, impressive gains in perplexity. And you can imagine that this is very useful for when you need to predict tokens like numbers or named entities or various things that are very kind of like long tail and it's hard to imagine that the model will necessarily remember them if they do not appear in the immediate context. But uh, in this paper uh, by Ori, we examine how robust these language models are to cases where the retrieval is wrong. And there's been other parallel work that have shown similar uh, findings that in fact, uh, these language models are very not robust. Like if you feed them um, text uh, that is irrelevant, it can distract the language model and lead to, to, to errors. So um, the language model is not used to seeing these passages stitched to like the query and this change in distribution could lead to unexpected behavior. So here's an example. Uh, this will be mostly in the context of answering question. You have a question, who is the actor playing Jason on General Hospital? If you ask uh, Llama 2, 13 billion, this is the language model I think in this case, it knows the answer. The answer is Steve Burton. I don't know, it's probably true. I trust Oli who made this slide. I didn't like uh, the fact check. Um, but if you retrieve a passage from this query using Google search engine, you get like this query that contains Jason and contains General Hospital, but just it happens that this guy, Jason Hart, it, like he played Cooper Bar Barrett. So there's like a clash between the name of the character and the name of the actor. And now the model uh, is confused by this and will produce Jason Gerard. Okay, so that's like an example where the context is distracting. But even in cases it's irrelevant, you can get like crazy things that happen. So we kind of like try to uh, test this over multiple benchmarks. Um, in my work, I did a lot of work on question answering. So we took five uh, question answering benchmarks. This is called natural questions. It's very popular. It has these kind of like pretty simple questions, um, not necessarily about very frequent knowledge, but things like, you know, like, uh, I don't know, like uh, how many gold medals did someone win in the Olympics, stuff like that. <laughs> Uh, then there's these two, what's called explicit multi-hop quest, uh, question data sets. These are things where you need to kind of like ask multiple questions to answer the question. If you don't know it, it's things like, uh, I don't know, what's the nationality of the wife of the director of Titanic, something like that. So you need to like kind of like ex get like a bunch of those. You can think of those like more complex queries. Um, and then there's these two data sets that are what's called uh, implicit multi-hop questions, where again, you need to kind of like Fit, like to answer the questions, supposedly, you're supposed to ask multiple questions, uh, but it's not immediately clear from the language what these questions should be. You kind of like need to use common sense. So an example from our original strategy QA paper is like, uh, which is not like an example of the data set is, did Aristotle use a laptop? So, you know, the answer is no. And the reason is, you know, we think, well, Aristotle, like, well, what time did he live in? And laptop, well, when were they invented? Well, there's this mismatch, so the answer is probably no. But it's not, like, evident from the language. You need to kind of, like, design some strategy. So we try to, like, use these pretty diverse tasks. And what you see, basically, is that when you use, like, very high-quality retrieval, then in the explicit and simple cases, the, the performance really improves. But in like more complex scenarios, like uh, the Fermi data set and strategy QA, actually retrieval hurts you. And if you actually on purpose feed the model with passages that are not the top ranked, so this is just like trying to simulate. So again, Google search engine is really good, but you can try to simulate a case where maybe retrieval is bad, or maybe you can't use Google search engine because it's like private data or something. And if you're using a much strong, a much weaker retriever, so this is like random from the top 20 or something, um, then in all the cases 
the performance decreases substantially. And this seems just wrong, right? Like it seems like a, a bit, basically a fundamental property of retrieval augmented language well should be that adding information should not hurt you. That should be the case. And it's, it's just like not, it's not, it's not where we are right now. Okay, so we try to do a little bit, a little bit of work around like how to mitigate that. So here is again an example, just to so you have it clear in your head. What does this look like? Most of the questions that we work with are these what's called complex questions. Is it true that Colonel Walter Welps served the way the United States Army for more than thirty years? And there's like what's called a chain of thought, if you heard of it, or self ask, where you actually ask the model if you can kind of like try to answer this step by step, try to kind of like decompose this into a sequence of steps that you can perform more reliably. So the way that we do this is we do, we ask them all, can you please try to answer this step by step? And it says, okay, first I'm going to ask who is Colonel Walter Welps. We're using Google search engine to retrieve some text. And now we're answering the question given this evidence and the question. And it says Colonel Walter Welps was an officer in the Union Army throughout the American Civil War. And then we ask them all, well, do you want to ask more question uh, given all this? And it says, well, how long did they, they serve in the United States Army? This decomposition is not like amazing, but that's what it is. And 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 it it outputs this table. This is actually like a table linearized. Uh, and then given all this, we're asking, well, you know, how long did he serve in the army? And it's four years. So the final answer is no. So this is the process. You kind of like ask iteratively the model. Do you want to ask more questions? You retrieve evidence, you concatenate the evidence, and then you, you iterate basically. So that's the way it works. So how do you go about trying to make the, the models more robust? Uh, well, the first very simple uh, idea is to do this post hoc. So you just run your model twice, once with retrieval and once without retrieval, and you choose which branch to use based on a verification process. So one thing that you can say, you know, generating like an answer is really hard, but verifying that it's correct might be easier, right? Like uh, that's uh, that makes sense in computer science. So um, so you can kind of like show the model. Here are the here is the evidence. Here is the question, here is the answer. Do you think that based on the evidence, it makes sense that this is the answer to the question? So given like Jason Gerhardt is an American actor, he's known for playing the role of Cooper Barrett, does it make sense that who is the actor playing Jason is Jason Gerhardt? And the answer is no, right? That like when you verify this, you should get like that the answer is no. And there are what's called natural language inference or textual entailment systems that can do this pretty reliably nowadays. I mean, it's not perfect. I mean, this is not like a perfect procedure, but you can imagine that this can like uh, filter out many of the mistakes. So this is one very, very simple approach. The second approach would be what I uh, described before, which is uh, this adapt LM, where you want to basically say, well, I want to change the parameters of the language model such that it learns that sometimes uh, passages that it gets as input can contain irrelevant information. Uh, and the main challenge in doing that is basically generating data. How do you generate data that, that allows the model to learn that? And again, I'm not gonna go into a lot of technical details, but what we do is like given some complex question, like the one that we saw here, like, is it true that Colonel Phelps, we take like a very good language model like GPT-4 and we generate a lot of decompositions from it. One using greedy decoding, which outputs what's called like the, you know, like an approximation for the most probable output. And then we also sample a bunch of other decompositions, which might have slightly lower probability. And in any case where for a question that we have, uh, all of these decompositions agree on the final answer, then we assume that this, this decomposition is correct. So it's this, mechanism where you basically distill information from a very large language model uh, and have some self-consistency metric to make sure that we're only using outputs from the language model that are likely to be correct. And we manually verify this works like 90% of the time. So we generate data and now we, after we do this, again, I don't think like the details are very important. Uh, we can get like these triples, which are a question, a decomposition and an answer. Um, and now we can do like standard fine tuning, basically teach the model for every step in the decomposition to output the right answer uh, whenever it can. 
Uh, and we use like what's called QLORA to make this parameter efficient. I mean, there are details that are not important. Uh, so what do the results look like at a, like in a nutshell? Like what's the takeaway from this? The first takeaway is that by, by applying filtering with NLI, you can be pretty safe. Like, so if you compare like the green thing to the uh, blue thing, then you will see that green is almost, is always roughly the same or better than the blue. Okay, that's that's my point. Both in the case when you use the best output from Google and the case where you use the tenth best output from Google. So like NLI makes sure that you don't accept outputs that are very, very bad, but you're not really getting all the gains that you can. Conversely, uh, if you fine tune, so we only have these for three data sets, you get much better performance. So the model kind of like learns. So if you fine tune it on natural questions, you get much better robustness on natural questions. If you fine tune it on strategy QA, you get much better performance on strategy QA. So this adapting LM is, is working. The problem is, uh, I guess, yeah, this is what I say here. I'll just say it while you're looking at the screen that of course this makes the model very specialized. So what's nice about, about, nice about language models is that they're very general, general purpose. You can use them for many tasks um, using many formats, but fine tuning kind of like specializes the model to very particular use cases. And let's say if you fine tune on uh, this strategy QA, you're not gonna, going to get good performance on Fermi. Uh, so this is, this is an issue. So there are these two solutions. One of them kind of like is safe, but not maximizes the accuracy, the other, gets good accuracy, but like hurts generality basically. Uh, yeah, so that's all I want to say about this. So, so again, in the space of retrieval augmented language models, there's what's called in context realms. They're simple, they're useful, um, but they lead to robustness issues. These models are not, do not handle well retrieved text that is distracting uh, or kind of like contradicting in various other phenomena. Uh, you can use uh, post hoc filtering to kind of like mitigate that, but the, the, this is at the expense of actually using the retrieved text properly. Uh, and you can fine tune, uh, but this requires generating data. And we propose some procedure for doing that over a few data sets, but there are like details on how you do that. And you, you heard the generality of the model. Uh, yeah. And I think this, again, this, this lesson is kind of like, more general than just for retrieval augmented language modeling. People now are using RLHF and they observe these phenomena like called like reward over optimization where basically you need to be very careful in your fine tuning procedure. You take like a model that is very, very general and you can kind of like collapse it sometimes into undesired behaviors. Uh, so this is like, I think something that is relevant in general across uh, many of the works that are being done nowadays. So that's all I want to say about this particular uh, line of work. Any questions about that? Okay, so now I wanna briefly talk about the second scenario, uh, this one. This is work by Ohad and Jonathan and me. Uh, Jonathan was my student and Ohad is still. <clears throat> Where, as I said, like maybe you have a huge language model, um, but you don't want to touch its parameters. It's like, I don't know, it's like 540 billion parameters. Uh, you, it is being served through an API. You don't have access to it, uh, but you want to use it for, for some task. Uh, and what we're going to do is going to train a retriever that is specialized to work well for a particular task for that language model. Okay, so again, this is like the, the, the experimental setup is what's called uh, in-context learning which is really this amazing ability, which was perhaps the most surprising thing um, that happened when GPT-3 was exposed that basically you can just show, GPT-4 is a language model, meaning it was GPT, let's say GPT-3, uh, it was trained on a lot of text on just predicting the next token, no instruction fine tuning. Um, and it was shown that you can just like show GPT examples for a task that you would like it to perform and then it performs it without any parameter updates no gradient descent nothing so you know you show it this is from the original paper bad english i eat the purple berries good english i ate the purple berries 
bad English, I'd be more than happy to work with you in another project. And if outputs good English, I'd be more than happy to work with you on another project. Kind of like gets the pattern and understands what is the task. And from that, like generates the right output. This is really mind blowing. I don't know. This is, this is amazing. Uh, this was like a, a promise for like just one model that just, you know, perform any NLP task. But, but pretty quickly, as people started working with in context learning, they noticed that there's sensitivity to the examples that you choose. So this is an example, again, for translating from natural language to some API calls. I don't know, whatever. This is some, some example. And, you know, you try to do this for like the task of translating some target, target command, and you just get an error. But they say, oh, OK, maybe I should choose like a different example. Uh, I'm going to change the example, and that, now it's working great, right? So, so again, it's it's not really robust to the types of examples that you retrieve. So the question is, can we, assuming that we have this language model, we don't have access to it, we don't want to fine tune its parameters, we just want to use one model, how do we choose the right examples to show it, show the model in the context of a particular task that I would like to do? So that's that's the question. And very quickly, this is from 2021, people were like, okay, so given some question, I can just use the question to decide what examples to retrieve. So let's say we're doing question answering and I'm asking, what county is Frederick, Maryland in? Okay, that's my test question. I have a test question, but I also have training data. This is my training data. Uh, each training data is like a pair of a question and answer. So I'm just showing the question. Like this is one question, what athlete won the most medals? And this is the question, what county is Duluth, Minnesota in? I, I can embed these, I can design any like distance metric that I want. Maybe I kind of like embed them in some high dimensional space or low dimensional space and uh, compute like some, some similarity function like cosine or dot product or something. And then when I want to answer the quest, the test question, I just choose like the nearest neighbors. So it's just like a nearest neighbor approach. And then I get the answer. And very quickly, people show that by like more cleverly designing what examples, given a test uh, example, like an input, you want to generate an output, what input output pairs should you show the model? Then by doing this like a, in a clever way, you can get gains in performance. So these are like five data sets and like the orange is how much improvement you get by retrieving in a more uh, clever manner. Uh, so in, in our work, what we were wondering if we can train the retriever specifically for retrieving the best possible examples for, uh, for, for a language model. So this is what we, we proposed. Uh, let's say that uh, you have a training set and you want to train a retriever. So we're going to ask ourselves for like some training example, X star, Y star. What other examples X, Y will be good uh, as additional context. Uh, these are also called prompts. And the answer is like the good ones are those that maximize the probability of Y star. Okay, so let's say I want to find what is like the best example to provide as context when, I, when I'm trying to answer the question, what is the fastest animal over some knowledge base? Then I can like prepend uh, another example, which is the uh, highest mountain, and the highest mountain is extracted from the knowledge base by taking the argmax operation over a table of mountains and projecting to the column of heights. Um, and when I add this example, I see that suddenly the probability, according to the language model, of the correct output is substantially increased, right? So you can, um, you can increase your probability in this manner. Um, and more than that, if you assume that language models are similar to one another, then you can even say, okay, when I'm doing this scoring, I might use a very, very small language model. But at test time, I'm going to use like the, the biggest language model that I have. So I'm learning the retriever. I'm learning to retrieve examples that are useful um, for some language models. And I'm hoping that this transfers to other larger language models as well. So this is the overall idea. And again, if it's not clear, feel free to ask questions. Okay, so here's again, like very quickly, how we train the retriever. Uh, we're now basically generating data, right? We, we have the training set or we're generating data to train the retriever. So let's say this is the training example. What is the length of the longest river in the USA? And this is some made up um, pseudo SQL language. 
um, and this is like the true target, then what I can do is do the following. First of all, because of complexity issues, never mind. I want to get like a good set of candidates. What are good candidates that I think will be good potential um, uh, in context example? Examples that I think might be useful if I wanted to decode the output. And importantly, because we are at training time, we can use the label, right? Unlike, unlike test time where I get just the input and I need to find like examples based on the input because we're generating data, we can actually use the output. We can ask like, what are other examples in the training set who's, where the structure of the output is similar to the structure of the target output that we care about? So this is pretty powerful actually. <clears throat> and then we take each one of these uh, examples, concatenate them to the input question, pass them through the language model and check what is the probability of the output conditioned on the example and the input. And we get all these scores. And now we can declare examples that lead to high probability as positive examples and examples that lead to low probability as negative examples. But typically these are pretty hard negative examples because they were kind of like retrieved with this unsupervised retriever. And once you have positive examples and negative examples, you can use like standard contrastive learning approaches in case you know them to train a retriever that takes uh, an utterance, a query as input and retrieves uh, pairs, input output pairs, basically prompts. Cool. So um, I think we, I think I explained this more or less uh, before. How, what is exactly the score? Well, the score, just to be very explicit, it's like this. So what's the score for this example, EI? We concatenate the example EI to the target query X star. So it's the score with respect to X star. I just compute the log probability of the output conditioned on this, on this text. And this is the score basically. Cool. And then at inference time, I get some, some, um, some test query. I have this database and I, using my trained retriever, I can score all of them <clears throat> and then concatenate to the language model, the highest scoring examples. And hopefully this will improve. And lo and behold, the results, um, we show that by, so the orange is our method on three tasks of translating from natural language to formal language. Uh, we showed that by learning a retriever, you can do better than um, multiple unsupervised methods that do not train the retriever at all. Uh, and another method that does train the retriever, but does, the, does it in a more heuristic fashion, just kind of like tags positive examples and negative examples based on surface similarity. So like positive examples are those that are similar to your uh, input question and negative are those that are dissimilar based on some string similarity metric. Unlike us, where we actually use the probability of a language model for this, for this tagging procedure. Okay, cool. So intermediate summary um, for this particular work. <clears throat> Another instance of retrieval augmented language modeling is in cases where you want to use a large language model with in-context learning, but you want to make sure that the way that you choose the examples is optimized with respect to the language model that you're going to use. And this has been expanded recently to other setups like general purpose language modeling and question answering in a paper called Replug uh, that has also other very cool stuff that you can check out. Cool. I'm just going to skip this. Uh, just skip it. Okay. Because I want to spend maybe the last, uh, what I have, 13 minutes uh, talking about end to end training. So we talked about independent retrieval augmented language modeling, uh, about adapting the language model, fine tuning it towards the retriever, and training the retriever to retrieve examples that are useful for the language model. Uh, but what about end to end training? Like, you know, traditionally in machine learning, I don't know, like, and to like joint learning is good. Like you have like a bunch of parameters and you want all of the components to be aware of all of the other components. Uh, you know, this is basically neural net, like deep learning, the deep learning revolution was all about like not having pipelines and having like just one monolithic system that kind of like works across the board. Uh, but in retrieval augmented language modeling, this is not really how things work right now. So I don't know, it's weird. Oh, what happened? This is not Ohad Rubin. Um, so again, a little bit of background. Um, so one pretty prominent um, work that is not joint training 
is retro. So retro is in like adapt LM approach, just like what I showed um, in Ori's work where you adapt the language model to perform well in the context of a retriever. Retro has done the same two years before. <laughs> um, uh, and also like at scale, pre-training, like they actually pre-trained a language model from scratch in the context of a retriever. So let's spend like uh, one minute on this on this uh, slide. So it's just like this general performer, uh, transformer, a transformer kind of like takes tokens. Each square is a token. And they have this notion of chunk where kind of like you chunk tokens to sequences of 64 tokens or something. And in transformer, the usual thing is that you embed the tokens and then you contextualize the tokens by allowing each uh, token to attend to another. And then let's skip this. You have like a feedforward network per position that does some nonlinear transformation. And what was new in retro is that they added this what's called a cross chunk attention, where at this point, like these tokens that are now contextualized are also allowed to look at other chunks from the corpus, like the green and the blue one, uh, and fuse information from those chunks back into the model. So this is retriever is fixed, it's not trained, but when you're kind of like, this is language modeling, so the input is C1 and C2, and you're going to predict C3. So when you're predicting C3, you're going to have additional information that is retrieved from an external data store that was pre-trained in advance, and it has nothing to do with it, okay? So yeah, so this is the cross attention. Uh, so this is one approach. It's like the adapt LM approach. And then in work from Princeton, uh, they propose what's called Trime LM, where the idea is the following. They did want to train both the language model and the retriever jointly. Um, so what, what does Trime LM do? Well, Trime LM is based on what's called KNN LM. Uh, okay, maybe it's a lot of information. I'll try to be uh, precise. So typically language models uh, have this term. We're given some prefix X, you get a distribution over all outputs uh, V, all the, all the next tokens, and you get the probability for each of the next tokens. So in K and NLM, what they did, uh, which is what like, 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 it's like test time retrieval augmentation, they interpolate this probability distribution with another distribution. And what is this second distribution? I will tell you immediately. Uh, the second distribution is based on like a nearest neighbor approach. You take a vector representation of X, and just find in a very big corpus other instances of representations that are very similar to X, uh, K in this case, and you just check what is the word that follows the context K. And you apply a softmax based on the distance. So this is like a memorization approach. Like I have some text, I find like 20 other texts in the corpus that are similar, and I assume that the next token is going to be similar to the tokens that appear in the corpus. That's like a k-nearest neighbor approach. But in k and LM, LM, this component was not trained at all. It was just like fixed. And what they did in Trime is they proposed a procedure for joint training of these components. So this is basically the retriever, right? Like you have like this retriever component. Um, and again, it's not trivial. Again, due to lack of time, not gonna get to the technical details, like, uh, but like training these two components together is challenging. Why is it challenging? Because you're working with this huge corpus and you don't want to re-encode the corpus every time you're making a parameter update. So they use kind of like these smart batching techniques. I don't know, I don't want to say nothing, but I, I think like saying everything will be uh, maybe too much time, but in maybe it's not so complex. Basically you just train on your, like your batches. You create like a batch, it's a pretty big batch. And in the batch, instead of like just like randomly putting sequences of tokens, you put sequences of tokens that are very, very similar. And so when you predict the word apple here, you have other instances of apple in the batch just because you, you, you kind of like construct the batch in a smart way. And then by the fact that you have kind of like similar, similar context here, you can update the representations of, the, of your model just based on this batch. Not use the whole corpus, just use like this batch for training and because you kind of like have like high information density in the batch, this is effective basically. So this is what they propose, joint trade. Okay, but it does have like these two important uh, disadvantages. 
The first is, as I said, is it's, it's based on lexical supervision. So as how do I construct the batch? Well, if I want to predict the word apple for some to for some sequence, I'm going to look for other contexts that also contain the word apple. So again, the batch is constructed in a way that is is very lexical. It doesn't really use semantic information. It uses lexical information. And the, the second kind of like not super satisfying thing is that uh, in the end, like the way that the retriever and the language models are combined is just through very shallow interpolation. You have like a language model distribution, you have a retriever distribution and you're, you interpolate. So the information passed between the language and the retriever is pretty limited. Okay, so, so here's basically what we propose, retrieval pre-trained transformer. So I, I, I described so far three uh, uh, things and this is the new thing. So trine is trained jointly, which is great but it only kind of like combines information between the lang between the language wall and the retriever in the final layer and the supervision it uses is lexical there's retro which is an adapt language model approach which fuses information very very deeply uh, but it doesn't train a retriever at all it just uses a fixed retriever and then i described epr if you remember in the second part of the talk where we adapted the retriever to the language model it adapts the retriever um, never mind where it uses the retriever, um, and it uses very semantic supervision. So this work by Ohad, which is currently under submission, uh, we try to jointly train a language model to strongly fuse the information between the language model and the retriever, and to use semantic supervision for that. Okay. In the last, like, I don't know, a few minutes, I will try to describe how this is done. Um, so let's say that you have a language modeling task where you get some chunk of text and you need to predict the next chunk of text. All our experiments are in the context of trying to generate books, which is like easy. It's not necessarily the most compelling application of retrieval augmented language modeling, but it was something that was feasible for us to do. So we want to predict the next chunk. Uh, then what will we do? Uh, we will look at previous chunks from the book. This is like a book. This is chunk 201, and this is chunk 202. We're going to retrieve chunks. How will we do this? We will pass them to a transformer decoder, which is something that encodes language. Uh, so there will be like the bottom layers will encode the input. Then a retriever will retrieve the most relevant chunks. And then the information will be fused such that uh, we can predict the next token. So uh, again, this is like um, the information is fused within the model, not just at the output. And all this thing is, is trained jointly. Um, here's the architecture. I don't think I have time to go into the details. I can say like at a high level, this is like some standard transformer that encodes like the input. Um, there's a retriever component that basically looks for nearest neighbors in the, like, let's say I'm in chapter 23, the, so it retrieves some, some chunks from chapter 21. Um, and then uh, after retrieval, this is fused using chunked cross attention, which is identical to what was done at retro. Um, and the only thing basically that remains for me to say, assuming that we just skipped like the architecture basically, is how do we train the retriever? And again, because there's like a top K operation, it's not end-to-end -end differentiable. So we use this auxiliary semantic uh, objective where the idea is identical to EPR. Uh, if I want to, if I have like uh, some, some chunk of text, X star followed by Y star, which previous chunks X, Y will be good neighbors to, to attend over. And we use exactly the same intuition as we used in EPR. So we're going to take, so let's say I'm, I'm in chunk 201, I'm going to retrieve chunk 13 and see whether the probability of chunk 202 increases. And if it increases, I will label this as a positive example. Uh, and it's a little bit more complex in language modeling because the information is very, 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 very sparse. It's because most of the previous chunks are useless. Uh, so we have this filtering criteria where we only accept positive examples, C13, only if the, they increase probability more than the, the previous chunk. So if, chunk, if some chunk increase, increases the probability of the output more than a very, very near chunk, 
then this is a positive example. So we're looking for far away chunks that are more effective than very, very close chunks. And those far away chunks are labeled as positive examples. And this is the semantic supervision. Okay, I'm out of time almost, but like uh, we test this on four data sets. You can see the length. They're about, you know, about 100,000, 50,000, 100,000 tokens each. It's books and code uh, and uh, scientific papers, basically. And the important thing to look at is the, improve, the improvement in perplexity. And this is the green, the green uh, bar, which does better than using lexical supervision, which is the, the, the red bar. So semantic supervision outperforms lexical supervision. And also joint training, the green bar is better than the blue bar, which is sequential, sequential training. So joint training outperforms uh, sequential training. And the rest I'm just going to skip. Okay, so to summarize, uh, we train jointly both a retriever and a language model with a semantic objective. Now, of course, all this was just um, um, over long documents. And the real potential of this is to actually pre-train a very large language, language model with this, with this uh, procedure. Uh, and this is non-trivial, actually. So this is something that we're working on now. And the main challenge is actually, how do you construct your data? Um, so if you remember, I saw, told you about this batching technique that was used in Trime. So you need to think about how do you construct data such that you get good signal for the retriever during training. And this is something that is ongoing work that we're doing right now. We also have huge scale and compute problems that we're applying to Google. Even though I'm at Google, this is, I'm not in Google in the context of this particular project. Okay, so I'm just going to go two minutes over for, for wrapping up. Um, I think retrieval augmented language model are still an unfulfilled promise. So they seem intuitively very, very sensible, but there's no like clear recipe on how to use them. There's independently kind of like using retriever in language models. This kind of works. It's extremely simple, but it's pretty brittle. It doesn't, it's not really robust. There's adapting the language model towards the retriever. This is effective, but leads to over specialization, as I showed you. There's adapting the retriever to the language models, which is uh, effective, uh, but it's for pretty particular use cases where you don't want to touch the language model. That's not necessarily the broadest use case that people are interested in. And then there's joint training, which for some reason uh, does not exist as far as I know uh, properly. Um, so to summarize, uh, I think retrieval augmentation, ma augmentation makes a lot of sense, but there's no clear recipe, as I said, on how to train them exactly where exactly should inf retrieved information be fused? What is the right architecture to do it? How do you construct data for pre-training? You know, like, should it be pre-training with retrieval? Should it be like an additional fine tuning step? There's a lot of still, there's no clarity on like what's an effective way to do this. Uh, more broadly, I think retrieval can be viewed as part of like this even broader research scope where people are interested in using tools in general Again, for similar reasons, right? For improving factuality, for improving explainability, for robustness, for you know, for using all these tools for like it's kind of like a similar set of motivations. Uh, and retrieval can be viewed as like potentially maybe the most important tool in our toolbox. So I think uh, there, we're going to see a lot of that. Uh, and yeah, and I think this is still an open field with a lot of interesting research to be done. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much for this super interesting talk. Um, it was very, very interesting to see, you know, this uh, kind of very recent line of work uh, in this in this new direction. Um, it's great because we still have also now uh, a lot of time to discuss and, um, you know, go into details of, of, of these papers, but maybe also of the other topics. So um, I will just now open the floor to questions um, and I would ask people, please just maybe raise your hand in, in WebEx. Uh, I'll try to keep track of who comes first and who comes uh, comes next, um, and we we'll just go through through the questions. And um, I look forward to a hopefully an interesting discussion. So, does anyone have uh, questions uh, to Jonathan already now directly? Quickly scrolling up and down here to see. Yeah, yeah, Steffen. Thank you very much for your talk. Very interesting. Uh, you had. The notion of causal language models several times on your slides. Right. 
Um, uh, what did you associate with that? Is this just a specific use of the language model or is this a specific yeah, in, yeah, it's a specific version. Um, people, I don't know, maybe causal is like a bad word, but people use it. So typically transformers come, there's like what's called an encoder transformers, encoder decoder transformers and decoder transformers. So causal language models like decoder only. So it's causal in the sense that like every token can only uh, observe, attend to previous token and is not allowed to look at uh, uh, um, future tokens. Again, because we were in the context of, first of all, they're very successful. Uh, most of the, uh, you know, commercial um, pre-trained language models nowadays that are deployed are typically decoder only model. So, you know, encoder decoder model have the advantage that you can get bi-directional attention. So for tokens can see the future for their inputs, which makes sense that that would be useful. But in many cases, the gains are not huge. So people can like just use uni these causal unidirectional language models. And in our case, because we're kind of like, Im we're imagining like this application of, of generating text, very, very long texts, then uh, it made sense to use like a causal language model. Uh, in other scenarios, like what's called like knowledge intensive language modeling, uh, where you, people, someone asks a question and retrieves information, uh, then it's pretty natural to use like what's called a bi-directional transformer on the input. So I, I have some query and I'm going to generate the answer. So the answer I'm going to generate token by token, but all the information that I retrieve, I encode bi-directionally. Every token can look both forward and backward. So causal is in the sense that tokens can only see the past, but there's nothing to do oh, with okay. No, because yeah, okay. thanks for clarifying. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? Otherwise, I also have one. Um, I think it was in the context of the adaptive retriever, the EPR. Um, approach mm -hmm. um yet is this bar plot where you also show you know the improvements um that your method achieved and i was wondering um you also showed the oracle case there and i was wondering like what are the error cases still like what is what remains to kind of close the gap further to the oracle performance um oh you, you i think it was yeah, yeah so exactly this one for example the oracle is basically performing at test time uh, the procedure that was used to label the training data, right? So at training time, what do we do? We take an example and we find the best uh, other example in the training set that maximizes the probability of the output. And then we train a model. So the gap is basically uh, the failure of training. Like if, tr if this is, if training was perfect, then we would get LM Oracle. But because training is not perfect, it doesn't generalize perfectly, this is, this is the gap. So like uh, labeling, um, like using the, if at test time you use the best possible training example, this is the, the, the output you get. So there's still more to do, maybe better training procedures, maybe a better objective, maybe get more data, but like training is not, this is like a pretty substantial gap due to the fact that training is far from being perfect. Right. Yeah, I think I was I was more thinking like, is there any specific error cases or or cases that you know this model cannot do well on or that it fails with? Um, you know that also explains at least part of this gap, or is it, you know? Yeah, um, I don't remember out of the top of my head. Uh, I think there's. Um, um, I can say like we had this other paper that I skipped where I don't know if it's in this particular data set that we know for sure like a, a very interesting failure, which we showed in another paper, so maybe it's not like based on this graph, is what's called compositional generalization. So what happens in when you use a retriever is that you get examples that are very, very similar. The retriever basically learns to uh, retrieve examples that look very, that as a similar, that are as similar as possible to the output. There are a lot of cases <laughs> or, or a lot of benchmarks that specifically test for compositional generalization. What does that mean? I can actually show um, where at training time, you have some, some structures, some structures of outputs. And then at test time, you get a structure that you have never seen before. Like it's by design, it's like a challenge test. It's like a stress test where specifically you're asking the model to generate, to, to generalize to structures that are unobserved at training time. 
And what happens is that if you just retrieve similar examples, you fail. So in this paper, what we show that in cases, I mean, it's hard to know in advance, but in cases where you, you might want to expect new structures, so you can think about it like programs have structures. So whenever like you get a new program that has a new structure, it's not sufficient to just learn a similarity metric. So in this work, we show that actually we try to retrieve a set where the set is like a set of um, examples that are similar somehow to the query, but are different from one another. So you want to have diversity. And then you, you basically try to kind of like cover all of the substructures. Uh, so one one so one particular failure case is, yeah, is generalizing to new things. Uh, uh, I think there is this notion that by doing retrieval, you're kind of like saying, you know, the output is going to be pretty similar to something that we already seen in the training set. It's never identical, right? But like, like it's going to be roughly the same. So, uh, so by doing in-context learning, you're memorizing, you're saying, here's something pretty similar. You just need to like, maybe, maybe change the table name, maybe replace the and with an or, but like by and large, it's going to be pretty similar. Mm -hmm. Um, just a quick, a quick follow-up. I mean, this to me sounds like like potentially a quite fundamental uh, limitation in the sense that you know if you always assume you know or if if the whole learning is kind of uh, revolving around finding similar stuff or you know similarity is is a core concept there. In, in general, does it mean then that this model would struggle this approach to um, yeah generalize to unseen or not so similar cases like? Or is that kind of not such a fundamental limitation as it at least to me sounds now? Um, uh, I mean, people are, I, I think there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of work on composition generalization. Like uh, if you asked me to talk uh, on, uh, two years ago, I would have talked just about composition generalization um, where uh, I think, again, this can be like a, a whole discussion. People have been interested in compositional generalization and have shown that pre-trained language models struggle on composition generalization, but uh, there have been a lot of approaches proposed to try to mitigate this without kind of like breaking the paradigm uh, by, you know, like by doing data augmentation uh, and, and, and by scaling. So there is evidence that with scale, generalization improves. Mm -hmm. um, and in some sense, I think, yeah, like, um, how should I say it? Like, it seems that it's possible to cover in your training data almost everything like the cases where new things kind of appear are pretty rare and the fact that transformers cannot do that is troubling and that's why people are working on it but from like a practical perspective like a lot of people say so what's the big deal we're just going to do data augmentation and we're going to make sure we cover everything that we need and once in a blue moon something new shows up okay i can live with that but yeah, some people are proposing, you know, like more high like biases towards kind of like more compositional approaches. Mm -hmm. It's extremely hard to uh, convince people to not use pre-trained language models because like there's like this huge community that has been optimizing this so strongly that in order to kind of like convince people that something fundamentally different is required, you're going to need like extremely compelling evidence that this is something that they should care about. I don't know, mm. it's more kind of like meta, uh, but I think, yeah, transformers have composition generalization issues. They are reduced with scale. They are reduced with data augmentation, but typically they do have this issue. And it's not just for, for retrieval, it's just like general mm. property. Right, right. Okay, thanks. Um, Stefan. Uh, it's all very fascinating. I still wonder, I mean, you describe these experiments at a certain point in time, right? And the language models have progressed so fast. So we will still need the uh, retrieval augmentation in two years time. Uh, if the language models progress even more, would you see things that, um, that you do now, which are necessary now, but not anymore, and things that would be permanently required? Yeah, it's an open question, right? I don't know. Like, I think there are people who are pushing towards, you know, there's like what's called like, uh, like, yeah, just basically memorizing everything inside the parameters of the transformer. I think that the arguments that I tried to lay out at the beginning for retrieval augmentations are pretty compelling. Like, I'm not a very decisive person, I have to say, in life. Like, I can be convinced of a lot of stuff. Um, 
So I don't know, but I, I just find like the reasons for using retrieval augmentation pretty compelling. Like I, I think it's going to be pretty hard to solve factuality uh, just through like clever decoding mechanisms. I don't know, maybe this one is actually, you can make progress. I think there's a lot of evidence that transformer, like pre-trained language models in their activations represent uncertainty. So you can imagine maybe like leveraging that to help the model avoid uh, making up stuff, maybe, but retrieval should be pretty useful. Again, provenance, freshness, how do you kind of like update models? For me, like retrieval augmentation makes a lot of sense from an aesthetic perspective, from like a common sense perspective. But, you know, I've been wrong a lot of <laughs> many times uh, and a lot of very smart people are really pushing like the scale and the compute front. And I'm not worried. Like, I, I think like, I think like this will be explored, right? Like the question that you're asking, we will get an answer. There will be people who will try to push not retrieval, no retrieval augmentation will be pushed to the limit. Mm -hmm. My guess is that this is not the most efficient way to do it. But, but I, I mean, I would agree, but I wanted to know your opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah know. we'll see. Know. Open question. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I, I think, uh, Elise, uh, I hope you pronounced your name correctly. I think you were first, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know if I was first, but I had a question. <laughs> um, so um, my question is, do you think this um, a retrieval augmentation, aug augment, augmented language models can be um, adapted to other types of uh, slightly different, I mean, the task is still the same as still retrieving, but in different contexts, such as, for example, extracting opinions? Because um, in your case, or at least in the ones that you showed, they were really related to facts. And even like facts, how can I distinguish? Like, because there are facts, uh, for example, asking questions about what's the capital of a, of a country. And also there are the facts of news articles, which can be even debated and what is a fact or not a fact, and et cetera. And then, and then there is also the, the case of extracting opinion or opinion yeah. mining, for example. Um, where in this case, I mean, in the ideal case, you would want to have uh, uh, the largest range of diversity possible uh, yeah. when you're extracting opinions. And in what you showed, um, you would usually extract the closest uh, uh, sentences, for example, for the, um, in, in some of the setups for the, um, yeah, for starting this process. So do you think this could be adapt adapted to this case as well? Or or can you imagine how it could be adapted? I know it falls a little bit out of your domain, but. No, no, I, I think this is like a fascinating use case. Uh, and I think it definitely, it, it's like, again, a, an open research direction. I think there are many cases where like basically you want to retrieve not just one thing, but maybe even like, I don't know, maybe 2000 snippets. And maybe there's like some relation between them. As I said, for compositional generalization, we had this method where you you're optimizing to retrieve not the best single example but a set and you can kind of like optimize for properties of the set for example that like the set will be diverse that elements so there's what's called the determinantal point processes where you kind of like very directly try to make sure that things are diverse i think this also um makes things hard not only in the retrieval part but also on the reader part the language model part because like this is related to what I said at the beginning that there's these like language models as data scientists, right? Where you can imagine like you want to give the model a pretty long sequence of text and make some pretty global aggregations over it. So like, I don't know, like you said, maybe you want to get like a lot of opinions and now you want to summarize them, maybe create a histogram. Like, I don't know, how do you make my baby sleep at night? Well, people have a lot of opinions. Maybe at the end, I want to have like a, bar plot of like what are the main solutions that people kind of like uh, propose and then the the reader needs to be able to handle very long text maybe 100,000 tokens and the retriever needs to retrieve everything like a very high recall setup also uh you have goldberg from barilan i know he has this new project on what's called like high recall retrieval uh, i just heard it about it in the talk so maybe i'm making it up but like he said that he wants to work on these cases 
where the, the, the object that you are retrieving is like a set that is very, very, very big. We also had to have this uh, data set that we released called Campari, where the output is like a list of maybe 50, 50 answers. So I think this is like an interesting setup that poses interesting challenges, both in terms of the retriever and also the reader. So I, I would be like really excited to see like something like, you know, what's your opinion on something? And then like you get like a bar plot of like the what people think about it. So yeah, I think that's super exciting. Matteo? Oh, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Uh, maybe you need to. Let me know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. That works. Yeah. So thanks. Thanks for the talk. Um, so I have a question which, which connects to back to the one which was just asked basically, and also the, the work that you mentioned. Um, so at some point in the very beginning, you said a few shots um, can be like helpful if there are good examples or they are, they can be bad uh, if there are not good examples. So my, my question is what happens if we have a mixture of the two, whether this kind of um proportionality of good example and bad example and then connecting back to also the news that yesterday came out that gpt4 is now having a huge context and this couple of works you mentioned that you're working with sets of retrieved objects so how, how much do you see the enlarging the context i mean the size the number of examples and uh, how many good or bad are there is is that enough that one is good uh, among like a thousand or yeah. So the first question was about like, uh, if you have a mixture of good and bad, right? So again, yeah. um, so we had this approach where we have like sim uh, a similarity and we order like the, the examples such that like the good ones are close to the output. Uh, that's like a pretty typical heuristic. Uh, there, there is a paper, which I can't remember right now, uh, its name, where they do kind of like exhaustively um, check how sensitive uh, models are to the order. And at the time, it was shown that they're pretty sensitive. So like if you have a mixture, like actually the, the location of the example within the context can, can, can lead to high variance in the output, which is of course not a desirable property. Um, I don't know, I've heard rumors that like uh, in recent models, this has become less of a, an issue, but I don't know. Uh, and I, I think it's kind of solvable, like again with, uh, I don't know, I don't know. I, I think it's like interesting to think like whether this is solvable with like an, some additional uh, training step um, about like using very, very long context. Yeah, I'm actually pretty curious, like, you know, they don't say what the architecture is because there's been all these advances. Like, are these still just dense transformers with a lot of compute or are they using like, in, I assume they're interleaving like sparse layers, but but still like it's, uh, I'm pretty curious, like about how how do you get like uh, very long context? Is, is it just like scaling, or is there some differences in architecture? And I think right now the situation is there's been multiple papers showing that if you have a long context and the information within it is sparse, then this again still leads to high variance. Um, there was what's called lost in the middle, where they showed that things that are at the beginning and the end are, are helpful, but things in the middle are not. Like if something is in the end, then it is used. If something, it's by Nelson Liu, something is in the beginning, then it's used. If it's in the middle, then it's kind of like lost. So it's called lost in the middle. Um, and I think this is, relates to the fact that we don't have a good pre-trained retrieval augmented language modeling. I think one of the one of the advantages of even, you know what, forget retrieval of language learning. Let, let's say that you train some model over 100,000 tokens. I think during pre-training, you need to make sure that it is trained such that it can use information arbitrarily from within the context. So like you need to think about how to construct your data such that the model will not learn this very strong bias towards either the beginning or the end. I don't think there's any reason to think that any of the existing models have this bias. And if they have it, uh, the, the, um, combat this bias. And I think if things are handled, they're done at fine tuning time. Maybe at fine tuning time, you kind of like try to adapt it to pay more attention. But it would be interesting, like 
if this was done at pre-training time, but maybe this is just like very expensive. So yeah, both of these things are brittle, brittle issues that I think are still, people are thinking about. Ideally, I think if, if we can kind of like, um, try to combat them starting at pre-training, think about this from pre-training, how this is handled, that would be probably most effective in my opinion. Thank you. Great, are there any other questions? I mean, I have, I have one more. It's more like a more head of a question. Um, so, you know, I mean, information retrieval, I mean, there's a whole community looking into retrieval systems in, in all sorts and, and, and ways. Um, and I'm wondering, um, I mean, do you expect now um, that, you know, all the these two communities will now kind of work more and there will be kind of a conference essentially between these areas, which I think so far, I mean, probably in some parts is there, but not at the same scale as, for example, language and vision, right, which have now really um emerged to some extent in some different areas and i was wondering do you expect something similar now with kind of the information retrieval you know um type of community and nlp or is that really two different in terms of methods and and approaches there yeah i mean i think there are some success stories right like already um uh, i mean again i just know about like uh, people who are very well known but right like there's the colbert uh line of work from stanford which I think was published in parallel, like both for the IR community and the ACL community. Uh, there's Jimmy Lin in Canada that does a very good job in kind of like integrating these. I think, I don't know, this is more about like academic incentives. There's a lot of like academic incentives for fragmentation. <laughs> like fragmentation is in some sense extremely uh, convenient uh, for people, but not necessarily for science. Uh, so I don't know, like it's uh, like, I think, um, I don't know enough about the IR community, but I think there's probably a large fraction where things are basically the same. And these, these, these communities should join similar to language and vision. Language and vision are still, in my opinion, more fragmented than they could be. Um, I think there's also, also like some movements, like kind of like disputing, I don't know, we can get, I mean, I kind of like worry, you know, nowadays, especially at Google DeepMind for like the NLP community, there are various kind of like external factors causing people to look more into like pure machine learning conferences. And this has been my home forever uh, for like the last uh, 14 years. So um, maybe like, uh, you know, there's like this new conference that was uh, um, announced, uh, Colm, I think, Column, uh, which kind of like, I don't know, is outside of the traditional ACL uh, community, but is specifically about language models. So I don't know, like things are shifting, moving. Uh, I have sentiments about this, so like, but I don't know like how it's going to turn out. I think in general, I think things should be more kind of like uh, unified but I can definitely see why it's difficult and like there's like a lot of strong incentive for fragmentation. So, uh, so yeah, but conceptually, I think these communities should be closer to one another than one, than what they are. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, I fully agree. I mean, fully agree. I was just curious because, you know, it's, it seems like now that kind of more and more, um, or at least in this line of work, is shifting a lot more what? into the retrieval uh, performance and how good the retriever is and how good it performs. It, it definitely would make sense also from my perspective to really, you know, collaborate much more closely with the retrieval people um, because they've been working on this for you know, a long time. Yeah. Uh, so I'm sure that something can be learned um, from from this line of work and, and used also uh, for benefit in this in this setting here. But I do see a lot of ideas from IR, like relevance feedback and other ideas, kind of like starting to flow towards NLP. Mm -hmm. Maybe it can be better and like be done like I think sometimes you see like glaring kind of like people ignoring one another, like people. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but I think things are improving, but they're still like uh, not. There's not a lot of improvement. Right. Okay, cool. Um, we're nearly at the end of the of the slot, um, but still, if there's any other question that anyone has, uh, now's the time, <laughs> now's the chance to ask it. Um, if not, then I think I will probably, you know, uh, essentially uh, end the session here. Um, I don't see any further hands up in the chat. Um, yeah, I think in this case, uh, Jonathan, I would I would end the session here. Um, Thank you so much again for giving the talk uh, and the very interesting discussion that we had. I think this was, was really exciting. Um, a few people left already. It's a pretty late here uh, already, but I think we're like 50 people um, peak. So I think that's really, really cool. Yeah, um, so thank you very much for, um, for your talk.
in the discussion and yeah have a good time at DeepMind uh, enjoy the uh, the time there and yeah let's see maybe see you at some point at the yeah. conference thank you I had fun thank you for the invite and uh, yeah have a nice bye. day uh, everyone else thanks for coming and have a nice evening bye bye bye